latest news are the news headlines starring Roy Hart, June Whitfield and Chris Emmett with Peter Moss and the Headliners. Well, Richard Clegg's only partly right there. Chris Emmett is here, certainly, but at the moment, no one else is. And why am I here? Well, I guess most of you will know by now that on the 31st of March 1994, the news headlines enters the record books. It becomes the longest-running scripted comedy show with an audience in the history of broadcasting in this country, breaking the record previously held by that good old stalwart, the Navy Lark. So we here in the light entertainment department thought it would be a good idea to spend an hour or so telling you a bit about the background to the headlines. How it first started, how the show is put together, what happens backstage, so to speak. In other words, to take you behind the headlines and hopefully share a few laughs along the way. So let's go back 19 years. Yes, 19 years, folks, and see how it all began. I talked to the very first producers of the news headlines, Simon Brett, whose idea it all was, and John Lloyd. Simon. I think it was sort of on the back of the success of Week Ending, which had been round since about 1970 and had been thought rather daring and alternative in its time, though the word alternative wasn't invented in that way. Yeah. Um, and, and then somebody said, well, maybe, maybe these um, people on Radio 2 could cope with something based on the news, but it would have to be a bit more populist. And maybe if it was presented by somebody more from the music hall tradition, um, this might appeal to their sensibilities. And I think we all felt that we were all rather proud of weekending, I think, in those days. Before it became the alternative yeah. Daniel Way. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and I think everybody felt that it was a shame that you couldn't hear any human laughter. The word that kept coming out was red-nosed, yeah, wasn't red -nosed, it? I, I think we right. would need a kind of red-nosed weekending, people kept saying. <laughs> Roy's was the nose. It, it was very difficult to pretend that Roy was, wasn't there right from the start, because somehow as soon as we started thinking about it, Roy's name was there and Roy seemed the right person. That's right, we had this title, you see, because <laughs> yes. we used HUD lines and we racked our brains with <laughs> somebody called HUD who could, who could fill the bill. Simon, who I think I'd met perhaps a couple of times, he wrote me up and said, now I've got this idea, he said, for a, a show, radio show, he said, it's going to be like a topical review. And I said, oh yeah, oh, his opening line was, are you doing anything on Wednesday? <laughs> <laughs> so I said, no, and that was the idea he had. Yeah. And he said, well, look, he said, all I've got so far, he said, I've got a title. He said, the news headlines I've got. I said, I'll do it. I mean, any show that's got your name in the title, how can you go wrong? And of course, I mean, Roy, you know, his history went back to that was the week yeah. and that kind of thing. So he was kind of uh, sort of allowed into the satire boom. <laughs> yes, his nose was only slightly red. Yes, it? yes, <laughs> sort of pinkish, pinkish. Yeah. Mm. I, I did have this problem, I remember, with um, when we were trying to set up the pilot. Um, Roy's agent, Maurice Azer, was asking what in those days was an extortionate amount of money, probably two guineas or something per programme. And, um, you know, I eventually talked to him on the phone and I said, well, look, look, Maurice, you know, come on, we can, we can always get someone else. <laughs> he said, well, for the news headlines. <laughs> 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 so, that was the title and the star taken care of. What about the rest of the cast? Myself and Janet Brown. I'd met Janet before. We'd done Sunday concerts mm. and that and variety and all that sort of stuff. And, I mean, Janet's great claim to fame was that she could do the Margaret Thatcher impression. At that stage, she was the impersonator. You know, she was the female voice, really, who did all the other voices. And, I mean, so that was a very logical decision. Um, and, again, hers was a kind of a different sort of background from the the sort of satire specialists, you know, hers was more, I mean, acting and music hall, that sort of background, so that seemed absolutely natural. And that just leaves, uh, now who else is there? Uh, oh, me, of course. Well, I'd been playing the entire Labour cabinet for Simon on weekending for about a year, so I guess I'd already passed the audition. <coughs> Thank you. So, on the 9th of June, 1975, Roy, Janet and I met for the very first time to record a pilot programme and it just so happened that we made a perfect comedy team right from the word go. Well, you know, it wasn't a total accident because mm. Simon Brett was a very wise fellow mm. and I think he knew what was what. And I think Simon, like all the best producers, really does know that the chemistry between the performers is, is as important, perhaps, as the, as the material itself is. And the pilot worked. So on Wednesday the 1st of October 1975, Radio 2 listeners, for the very first time, heard this. Here 
time with the very latest news is the News Headlines, starring Roy Hudd with Janet Brown, Chris Emmett and the Nick Rowley Trio. Well, good evening and welcome to the News Headlines, which is all about the latest news. Now, this week, the headlines are dominated by the big fight. Yes, the Labour Party conference. <laughs> now, here's something you won't believe. Bridget Bardot has been declared one of the seven wonders of the world by a group of industrial designers. Second came, would you believe, Hong Kong Harbour. That's what it says here. I've got a date to know with the Bristol Suspension Bridge. <laughs> Record Welsh came eighth and ninth. It's all in the sun. Now, on the same page, it's got this bit, I don't know if you see it, about all these celebrities talking about their first experience of the opposite sex. How It Happened by Cary Grant. Where It Happened by Debbie Reynolds. When Will It Happen by Larry Grayson. <laughs> <laughs> now, here's a crime story I like. Wasn't that polite? And so young. How <laughs> I've changed over the years. I got much ruder, <laughs> much more aggressive. Yes, yes, quiet, Roy. Let's hear Janet. Dear diary. <laughs> when? What a busy week I have had. I have just come back from North America where I have been visiting my overseas subjects in the colonies. <laughs> <laughs> what a nice man President Ford is, I thought, as he took my crown and scepter at the door. <laughs> Janet Brown there, treading an uncertain path through her very first Margaret Thatcher solo. But it wasn't long before she was soon up to full speed and, like the real thing, brimming with confidence. Good evening to you all, my most beloved subjects. No, please don't get up. <laughs> Just kneel back and relax. <laughs> well, here I stand on the threshold of greatness because you, the Conservative Party, have chosen me. And may I say, in all honesty and sincerity, from the bottom of my heart, about bleeding time. <laughs> <laughs> well, by the end of the first series, the show was a great hit with Radio 2 listeners. It really was very different at the time. It really was... Um, it started lambasting the politicians and getting the boot in and all this sort of stuff in a way that I don't really think had ever been done on radio, not, certainly not with an audience. Absolutely right. Here, for example, is yours truly getting to grips with Jim Callaghan, courtesy of writer David Renwick. Another portly political broadcast by the Prime Minister. The man described by one MP this week as the Tommy Cooper of politics. The right affable Jim Callaghan MP. Good evening. Try the egg, the bag, the bag, the egg. Egg, the bag. <laughs> as you know, Dennis and I have managed to secure a wage deal with the trade unions. This means that everybody will now have to really pull their weight. I did my share last night when I turned over in bed. <laughs> egg bag, bag egg, egg bag. <laughs> you know, I want to get one little thing perfectly straight, but then we all have our problems, don't we? <laughs> it's very easy to get up and spout a lot of half-witty rubbish about how we can solve inflation. At least I've always found it very easy. <laughs> The fact remains, though, that we are in the short term. <laughs> going to have to love make David's that. stuff. Because he now writes One Foot in the Grave, mm. and he's sort of famous and won mm. Lifetime Awards and things. But he always had that wonderful sort of the jokes were accessible to everybody, but they were very terribly clever, weren't they? Sort of always. And just that thing of doing a line that you've always heard one way, mm. and just turning it round, and you suddenly mm. realise that it has two meanings, which mm. had never mm. never struck you before. We were extremely fortunate during that first series to be blessed with so many good writers, including Colin Bostock Smith, Alistair Beaton and Andrew Marshall, who all went on to much greater success writing for television. I mean, I, th I think for the writers, The Hard Lines was quite liberating because, I mean, there are very few people for whom Weekending is the perfect thing to write for. 
you know, there are people who've done it extraordinarily well, but almost all of them have been kind of bending their style to the week, week ending style. Uh, because, you know, because there's no audience and that kind of thing, because the sketches are all very short and tight, you can't quite let your fancy flow in the way that you can with other kinds of writing. And I think Headlines opened that up for a lot of writers, particularly writers like Chris Miller, who had always written some wonderfully exact sketches for Week Ending. Suddenly, his sketches were still very tight and exact, but a kind of new dimension, a kind of devil-may-care quality mm. came into his writing. Indeed. And here's Roy with Chris's recipe for live evening up the football results on a Saturday afternoon. Here are the classified results. Derby County 2, Leicester City 1. Queen's Park Rangers 3, Aston Villa none. Middlesbrough 4, Norwich City 8. And Manchester United versus Ipswich started late. Arsenal 2, Burnley 1. Leeds United 4. Wolverhampton 4 as well, so it must have been a draw. Tottenham Hotspur nil, West Ham 23. Match abandoned when the Spurs fans killed the referee. <laughs> League Division 2. Bristol Rovers 4. Bristol City 6. A pair of Bristol's more. Blackburn Rovers 3. 3 to Luton Town. A man there said he hoped he'd got his draws correctly down. Fulham 1. Oxford 2. A Plymouth Argyle 3. Sunderland 11, and then they stop for tea. Bolton 3, Chelsea 1, what a dreadful ball. Still Division 2, and after that there's 3 and 4. Ah, oh, classic stuff. The third main writer in those early days was Peter Spence, who soon afterwards went on to write To the Manor Born for BBC television, but not before writing a classic Frank Sinatra parody for the Hudlines, which I think we'll save for the end of the programme. I remember the My Way thing oh, that, that yes. he wrote for, for Roy, you know, where suddenly, I mean, he was responding to a kind of musical tradition, and I mean, he'd worked with Roy before, but, you know, really rising to the challenge, you know. And I think they all enjoyed the writing. Roy's is, as you know, terribly good with people of all kinds, but great with Rice because he's so enthusiastic and he's very funny as a, as a human being. So um, the sort of, the fact that their, their work got really full welly, you know, that Roy would go out and sell the stuff Absolutely. and you would have yeah. these fantastic belters and great rounds of applause, made people, I think, tremendously loyal. Even when they weren't writing for Roy Hudd. What? Yes, that's right. Because on programme six, Roy started his monologue like this. Well, hello and welcome to this week's look at HUD's headlines. Now, first of all, I'm very sorry I wasn't here last week. I can explain that. British Rail were practising for Boxing Day. But, <laughs> <laughs> but that's not really what happened. We went to France for the weekend, myself and my missus, and it, the terrible fog came down and we just couldn't get back. And I tried everything. Then I got the message that Roy was stranded by fog and there was a headlines to the audience to come in at half past 12 and it was now sort of after 10 and there wasn't um, a presenter. So I'm sat there, aren't I, in the airport of Paris going mad when I should have been on doing the show. So I spent all that morning on the phone um, ringing Virtually everyone in show business, I think. I could even remember some of the excuses, But you called actually. Ray Allen first. Oh, we, no, we, we ended up with absolutely the best, of course. But um, <laughs> some of the people, I, I remember Bernard Cribbins said he'd, he was going fishing. Um, I mean, it is a strange question to ask someone where you say, I oh, wonder if you'd like to do a radio programme. Well, yes. Um, actually, it's standing in for Roy Hard. Ah. Uh, when? Well, um, about half an hour ago. <laughs> and actually, they were all terribly friendly. And we ended up with um, Ray Allen agreed to do it. Without Lord Charles. And so, for the only time in the past 19 years... It became the news headlines starring Ray Allen. Mind you, I've missed the odd one or two over the years. Whenever Chris was off, of course, we always used to get try and get David Jason in. <laughs> I mean, what, what happened to him? <laughs> Frightened, didn't it? Uh, yes. Not forgetting John Glover, who's also deputised for me on the odd occasion. Thanks, John. Checks in the post. Then there's the ladies, of course. Over the years, before Alison Steadman and June Whitfield joined us, Roy and I were occasionally joined at the mic by Faith Brown, Carol Heyman, Norma Ronald, Miriam Margulies, Denise Coffey, Barbara Rosenblatt and Nicola McAuliffe. What a cast list, eh? Sounds like a royal variety performance. 
By 1979, Simon Brett and John Lloyd had moved on to produce other projects, and Jonathan James Moore took over as the new producer. One of the first things he considered changing was the day of the week on which the Hudlines was broadcast. It all seemed ridiculous for a topical show to have its origination in the middle of the week and then have to wait till Saturday uh, to have the repeat, so that in a way you only had a half the week's news stories to draw on. So I was delighted when the then controller uh, agreed finally to move it on to the Thursday. And what about the writers at that time? Certainly the stalwarts I, I remember working through uh, uh, Andy Hamilton and Nick Revel, who do Million Pound Radio as performers now on Radio 4. And of course Andy does Drop the Dead Donkey. Um, Laurie Rowley, who's this wonderful uh, uh, plumber from Leeds, who would come in and fix any sketch known to man so that it would get a big laugh on every third line and an even bigger laugh at the end. Uh, now does um, Clive Anderson Talks Back. Uh, then, of course, there was Terry Ravenscroft, who Indeed, yeah. rather interestingly had been writing for Terry and June uh, and came over to Hudlines, and that was, I think, before June joined us. The other two people, I, in a way, I'm very proud of having brought to the programme are Jeremy Brown and uh, Richard Quick writing the songs. Indeed, yeah. Uh, I thought we, we got a, a standard going, which of course has lasted to this day. Mark Robson, who produced the show between 87 and 88, recounts working with these two new songwriters. I think that they were a genuine highlight of the show. I mean, it was a pleasure to work with Jeremy and Richard on the songs. One of the things that, we d that, that I did do that I was uh, very pleased to have been allowed to do was to introduce a serious side to some of the songs, so they weren't all knockabout music hall medleys, but uh, occasionally we'd try and touch on a, a slightly sadder subject, and music is the perfect medium to do that. And Paul Spencer, Mark's predecessor, adds... You can make more points, I think, with a song. You've got the rhythm, you've got the metre of the song to drag you along. I know it did, it did create problems to try and pick things up afterwards if you ever did anything serious like that. But I think it just gave the show balls, really, and it just gave it a lot more gravitas. Richard Quick himself readily agrees. It, it's nice sometimes when you can uh, feel that you know, the show's made, made a contribution in some way. I remember it was a, a serious number, actually, when the uh, doctor was on trial for what was, in fact, it was a very serious subject, a mercy killing. And uh, we, we did a, a little supportive number there. It was very short. But the audience accepts it and it's inside. And one feels that one's just saying, you know, we understand in some way. And I'm sure everybody remembers Jeremy Brown's poignant song that he wrote to cover the Jarrow March of 1986. Mark Robson again. That was the first one, I think. Yeah. That was the one that... I just talked to Jeremy on the phone and he was finding it a little bit difficult to find a subject for that week and he came up with the idea, well, I could do this, but it's not in the, the headlines mm. tradition. I said, well, have a crack at it, see how it turns out. And it did turn out beautifully. A long time ago, in 1934, to feed my five bands, I thought I was too poor. But now in the 1980s, well, things have improved indeed. For I've only got three babies that I am too poor to feed. We had the means test making us do with less. Things have improved. Well, we've got the DHSS. So what is our mission? You could call it a tradition. Every 50 years you'll see laddies from Jarrow marching southward painfully laddies from Jarrow we only want employment to pay rent we hate to have to bother the government that time in Hyde Park we found they didn't care We've done better this time round Trafalgar Square So you may cheer in London Here redundancy's low With, with poor laddies, laddies from Jarrow To tell you so
The unfortunate result of doing a serious song like that, however, is that it can swiftly chill an audience. And how do you get them back into a laughing mood? Well, we hit on a brilliant solution. And now, direct from their appearance in Cecil Parkinson's fairy grotto, Wigmore Street, <laughs> where they enchanted audiences as Santa's little helpers in their spectacular new Christmas show entitled It's Bad for Your Elf, or a whole lot of goblin going on, here they are, filling the stage with awful dust, those festive hardliners, Murdoch and Maxwell. Well, 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 if it isn't Mucky Murdoch. And it's the bald Bobby Maxwell. Yes, you don't think one's hanging lower than the other, do you? No more than usual, no. <laughs> but don't shake your head too much, they'll fall off your ears. <laughs> Clean that one up. But not for long, I can assure you. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely stuff. In time, Murdoch and Maxwell became the two Johnnies, a device which continues to give Richard and Jeremy their licence to chill. You know, the certain lines do actually stick in your mind. And the, and the one I always remember, Jeremy Brown is, is writing for us now brilliantly, and I always remember his one opening line of a parody to um, Just a Song at Twilight. And it was when Sean Connery was asked to play James Bond again and everyone said he was too old and the opening line was Jimmy Bond at twilight when the fights are slow <laughs> what a wonderful line <laughs> it was indeed but then the self-same Jeremy Brown unleashed this charming ditty upon the nation's airwaves sung by Roy call me George Michael Hud Oh, I am the phantom of a band called Wham. Now everybody calls me Oo. I found a girl who'd go out with me and we gate crashed the first night do. The sun photographer was there and the girl was busty blonde and tan. I said, hey babe, I could give you lunch. Do you mind if it's second hand? <laughs> Diced sweet and carrots. <laughs> Diced sweet and carrots. Lots of Lloyd Webber's free champagne. Unexpectedly back again. Regurgitated scotch and gin. Recycled hops and clarets. I did feel bad, should not have had those diced sweet and carrots. I have had a skinful, I have had a skinful. Where's the bathroom? Whoop, too late. <laughs> Jeremy, any comment? That's tasteless, isn't it? That's <laughs> terrible. Yes, but very funny. I'm all for bad taste, and, and uh, the programme has been known to, to have slightly questionable taste occasionally. I, I, I think it's great fun. There no doubt exist, I'm, well, we, we've seen them, um, old, dusty BBC directives on the subject of bad taste. I don't think we need those, really. I think we know in our bones when something is beyond the pale and when it isn't. Indeed we do. But there are still times when the Hudlines is accused of being a little smutty. Well, it's a George Roby's old phrase, you know, when they accused it, George Roby, the, Sir George Roby, the great musical comedian, he said, no, 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 he says, it's not smart, he said, it's honest vulgarity. Writer Andy Hamilton agrees. I think it's a very good counter from Roy that uh, the programme handles these things with honest vulgarity, because in fact, I mean, if you listen to, to say, a Ben Elton routine, I mean, there's an extraordinary amount of it that that, that is quite preoccupied with the ancient English traditions of the lavatory. Mm. I think there's something slightly more human about the, the way Roy approaches it. And Nick Revel. Somehow there's a way in the best kind of headline sketch that you would get this feeling that you were being embraced in a kind of conspiracy where it's like, look, we know this is going to be a silly sketch yeah. with lots of corny jokes in yeah. it and some inventive corny jokes yeah. and some ludicrous sound effects. But let's accept that, then we can get on with just enjoying it, whether it's classy or whether it's clever or whether it's bass or whatever. It's going to be funny, so just relax Go and take it. it on that. Yeah, you know, yeah. and to me, that was the key to the headlines, yeah. really, was the yeah. way that it's like, hey, we're here to laugh, OK, so relax, mm. enjoy and just laugh. We don't get smutty, which is a different thing entirely. We're not suggestive. We don't suggest anything. We say it. <laughs> It's true to say that tastes have changed since we began, but the one thing that has remained constant is the way the show is put together. John Lloyd. We used to do it in two days from a standing start. We'd start on, you know, as it were, on a Tuesday morning and rice it and finish ricing it on 
on Tuesday evening. You've got freelance stuff coming in through the post, mm. but the actual work, and, and it was a very economical thing, and very exciting, of course, so that you'd, you'd write it through, finish about seven, go to the pub, uh, and come in at nine or whatever it was we started the next morning, rehearse in the morning, record it, edit it in the afternoon, and put it out. Alan Nixon, who was responsible for producing the show between 81 and 82, recalls his modus operandi. Papers, 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 and more papers. The fear was always not having enough material, and or, or having material in a difficult week of news. That's always my, my memory of it. In fact, I did the series through the Falklands War, um, and BBC Radio was brave enough uh, to keep headlines on, but they took um, weekending off, which we thought was an interesting thing to do. But of course, the newspapers had absolutely nothing that we could touch because we couldn't be um, terribly political. Roy ended up having to start every sketch with them. Um, you know, looking through page nine, column seven of the News of the World, there's a story about the Pope, and that was it. That was all we had. And I think those were the most difficult times of trying to find when you knew that there was no material for the writers and therefore no sketches could be written. And, and when you went down to the studio, you just thought, oh my God, what can we do? Mm -hmm. But the team was so solid and strong that you could nearly always get away with it. Mark Robson. There was a, a fairly strict routine of calling up the writers on Monday and Tuesday to find out what stories they fancied doing. I tried to introduce a system of having proper official script meetings. You know, get everybody in, write, let's go th rip through the papers, see what's what, but they just fell apart. I mean, we just sat around taking the mickey out of each other all the time. So I used to just ring people up and say, what do you fancy doing? And they'd say, I don't know, what do you reckon? I don't know, what's in the sun? Have a look, <laughs> see what the big stories in the sun are. Who's dropped their trousers this week? And then Tuesday, Wednesday, the scripts would be written. And then Thursday morning, with great trepidation, they'd be presented to uh, Roy, Chris and June. And as far as each writer's material was concerned, we were just one part of the selection process. Producer Dirk Maggs. On the headlines, there were several hurdles that the writer had to get over before the script ever got heard by the audience on the air. First of all, it had to get through the producer, uh, uh, which is uh, occasionally easy, uh, but occasionally very difficult. Then it had to get past the cast at read through. And uh, I always remember uh, sitting there with uh, Roy, looking at a piece of paper and saying, you know, this one looks better written down. And then we'd all sort of nod to each other and rip out the sketch without another word being said. It sounds hard, but at the time, it was the only thing to do. We only had two hours to rehearse before we went on and recorded it. Final hurdle for the script was getting it past the audience. And of course, the Headlines audience are a very discerning bunch of people. And what about Paul Spencer's week as a producer? We never really had a meeting as such, a uh, weekly meeting. We used to have a meeting at the beginning of the series, and I think I chaired the shortest ever one, which was, hello, boys, let's go to the pub. And uh, that was about the length of the meeting, really. I think, on balance, Paul had the best idea there. Around 1981, when Janet Brown moved on, it left us with a bit of a vacuum, which, fortunately, Alan Nixon resolved when he found Alison Steadman for us. Yes, I mean, I'd always been an admirer of her uh, as an actress, and I think at the time she was doing the show with Ten Legs, or had begun to do that with Eddie Braben in Manchester, and being a northerner, uh, she joined up with Eddie, and I thought she might be an ideal replacement, and we asked her along, and she was thrilled to do it, but was, like a lot of sort of straight actresses, was terrified about the idea of doing mimicry, of having to do Thatcher and so on, and, and was slightly in awe of the memory of Janet, because Janet had been such a great Thatcher figure, one of the first people to do Thatcher's voice. Um, but oddly enough, over the years, she developed it, and, and I remember one quote saying she was one of the best Thatcher voices they'd ever had, because she got into the persona so much. Yeah, Alison is such a brilliant actress. I mean, it's quite amazing. And to stand next to her, to doing a radio show, I mean, she used to look like the characters that she was doing. Her face used to change, her whole attitude used to change. And Richard Clegg, old Clegg, who's been introducing the show for donkey's years, you know, said to me one day, he said, it's amazing, isn't it, you know, Roy? It's amazing. He said, when, when, um, Alison does an old age pensioner. Uh, it doesn't mean a thing to me, but when she does Lady Die, I fancy her like mad, you know. <laughs> but uh, her big coup really was um, Die, because as luck would have it, and does in the headlines, something always comes up that you can capitalize on in comedy terms. And Charlie got married, and Princess Die came along, and here we were with an absolute scoop. Um, and Jeff Axon started to write something called Die's Diary. Um, which Alison came up with a lovely, silly, giggly voice for, because no one had really heard 
uh, Princess Di or Lady Di, she then was, speaking. So we managed to build this lovely diary every week, which also became a postcard some weeks, depending where she was. And uh, Pete Moss came with a lovely piece of music at the front. And it was one of those things that um, was, I, I looked on the show often as a way of, I used to kind of compartmentalize it. This was a great way of doing all the royal jokes, just as another character. Friggins was a way of doing all the rude jokes. And here is Alison with just a short snatch of that glorious creation. Dear diary, mm, golly gosh, what a month. One has had hundreds of subjects knocking on one's door asking who one is going to vote for. First of all, we had the Labour candidate. Crikey, diary, what a hoot. <laughs> I've never seen a real beggar before. Well, the inevitable happened and Alison began to get more and more television and film work and, sadly for us, had to move on. The three musketeers were down to two again. But good fortune was at hand. June Whitfield takes up the story. <laughs> well, I was in pantomime with Roy at Richmond. So I think at, at the next matinee, I was playing the fairy in the pantomime and it was Dick Whittington and King Rat and Dick have a fight and the fairy organises it. So when it came about at that show, I said, um, Go to your corners and when you hear the bell, you come out fighting. And Roy <laughs> said, you've got the job. So that was, <laughs> well, a couple of months later, would you like to join the headlines? Yes, please. So that's really how it came about. And what a bonus June has been for us in the past ten years with her many voices. When it comes to choosing a voice for a particular character, it's true to say that on Radio 4's week ending, the performer tries to aim for an accurate impersonation, whereas on the HUD lines, we tend to go more for caricature, the radio equivalent of the newspaper cartoon, if you like. It makes the characters that much larger than life, and this fits more easily into the broader comic style of the programme. For example, June does a wonderfully acid Queen Elizabeth. I know these crackers get harder every year, they really do. <laughs> oh, one does love Christmas Day, Philip. Yes, one does. <laughs> one must just check the presents under the tree. What's this very large parcel for Princess Michael? Oh, something to help her with her next book. It's a, a photocopier. No. <laughs> I had the great honour of uh, receiving the OBE from Her Majesty herself and I was rather hoping that she hadn't been listening too closely to the headlines. <laughs> I think she might have snatched it back. <laughs> As for June's marvellously dotty queen mum, where did that voice come from? Michael Dines mainly writes it, and I think he had in mind a uh, horse race loving, um, fond of a G&T, a great sense of humour, and for some reason wanted her to be very down market. So I think I reached to the back of somewhere and came up with a sort of slightly wrong Irene Handel. <laughs> that, that's, that's how she happened. I think it'll go oh, 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 you oh do dear, it. go oh. oblige me. <laughs> oh, get off, you silly, silly sentimentalist. <laughs> I thought we parsley and time had come there. Oh, Queen Mar-in-law. <laughs> Compliments of the season. Grandma, are you enjoying the festivities? Oh, yes, dear. Not like them Christmases after the war, you know, with Sir Stifford Craps and his austerity. <laughs> no, had to get everything on the passion books then. There'd be roast chestnuts for dinner. Well, to go in the turkey? No, instead of the turkey, dear. <laughs> and Christmas pudding was a sprazzy with the raisin stuck both sides. <laughs> Would have gone round, too, if Margaret hadn't found the brandy sauce. <laughs> and then, <laughs> at the end of the day, I'd be in the scullery with a glass of British sherry. You drank British sherry? Oh, no, dear. It brought the spoons up a treat. <laughs> anyway, I'm well, sure all the royal family have a great sense of humour and they hope they realise it's all in the best possible test. <laughs> <laughs> and all good fun. As far as voices on the political front go, Roy has yet another debt of gratitude to pay to Ray Allen. 
And they said, well, you're playing Dennis Thatcher. And I thought, well, who can I make? Who, what sort of voice can I do for it, apart from my own, which I do most of the time? And I thought, I know. Well, he's, he looks just like Ray's dummy, Lord Charles. <laughs> so that's why I made him speak like that all the time, this silly ass. <laughs> <laughs> and it sort of somehow fits with his face and his image and everything. So thank you, thank you, Ray, very much for Lord Charles. And finding a voice to suit Norma Major presented the usual problems too, but not for long. We used to sit there talking to June and say, I don't know what voice to do for this. And all of us, without, you know, exception, used to say, do F, do F, F glum. Yeah. And she never would. She never would. She said, no, no, F glum, that was Take It From Here and, and all that sort of stuff. Well, after Take It From Here, um, almost everything I did, whether it was television sketch or radio or anything, somebody would say, oh, <clears throat> you know, do it like F. And I thought, no, I'm not going to do that, because otherwise everything I do ever will be F. So when Norma came up, and all we knew about her at the time was that she was very supportive of her husband. Uh, she was an ever-loving, quiet-at-home sort of person. And uh, so I thought, well, now maybe this is the time to revive F. And we knew nothing about Norma except she looked Norma exactly like I imagined F. Glum looked. <laughs> And suddenly, the opening line of the sketch was, Oh, John. We started reading, I said, Oh, are you there, Norma? Oh, John, instead of, Oh, Ron. And it was perfect. And she said, That I will do. And she did. She resurrected death, especially for us. Oh, John. Why don't you put a record on right now, my heart throb? No, 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 Norma. What about my duty as a statesman? Mm -hmm. Norma, stop doing that, Norma. Oh, Norma. <laughs> Which record would you like, Norma? You decide, beloved. Right. Meeny, meeny, moe. Just put anything on, kissykins. Oh, what's that? Great steam locomotives of the LMS. <laughs> 1943 to 53. It's my favourite. I, I tell you what, let's forget the soft music. Oh, here. Yeah. <laughs> Careful with my stylus, Norma. Now, take off your glasses. <laughs> like this. Yes. Yes. Oh, my God, John, you're... Yes? Exactly the same. <laughs> Well, never mind, leave them off and kiss me. Right. <laughs> Where are you, Norma? <laughs> Poor old mate, you can just see him there, can't he? he doesn't, I bet he never looked any different when he was 12 years old. Yeah. Yeah. I bet he was sitting on the edge of Clapham Junction, yeah. don't you, collecting those train numbers <laughs> even then, with his little glasses on. I've had a lot of fun too with these wild inventions. Norman Tebbit, for example, take his slightly sinister demeanour exaggerated and it easily transmogrifies into Peter Lorry, <laughs> which he then became for years. Again, take the horse-mad Major Ronald Ferguson. This gave writer Stuart Silver and I a golden opportunity to resurrect goon show favourite Major Dennis Bloodnock, and though I say it myself, it fitted him like a glove. Naughty dubbing you. <laughs> One more like that, there'll be a landslide. <laughs> no. Hello, my little Sarah. Are you flying today? Oh, no, Daddy. Just wearing high heels. Oh. Say, Daddy, is it true about you and the general election? It's all a lie. We were just two lonely soldiers together, I tell you. <laughs> Mind you, sometimes we don't even use a voice for a character. We rely on other skills. Alan Nixon again. One of my favourite sketches, which is completely silly, and uh, just a short one, was um, an advert appeared in Lonely Hearts column. The Cocoa Clown wanted a mate and had I put a, <laughs> an advert in the Lonely Hearts column. And the sketch that came was only 30 seconds long, I think, but the whole gist of it was the phone call from Alison to Cocoa the Clown. 
and Coco the clown answered purely in raspberry. <laughs> and the measure of Roy's skill as Coco was the number of ways the raspberry was done to indicate his response, whether, you know, lascivious or short or happy or pleased or sad for these 30 seconds. The punchline, which was a perfect little sketch, finally was they were going to meet at Victoria Station, Platform 5, and her last line was, just one thing, Coco, raspberry, how will I recognise you? <laughs> <laughs> it was a perfect little sketch, you know, it's mad, silly and great piece of radio because it all relied on Roy's ability to do raspberries. Sometimes, of course, our impersonations are wickedly accurate and that's a bonus. Round about 1980, Janet Brown was asked to tea with Margaret Thatcher at the House of Commons and whilst there, she asked the venerable lady if she ever listened to the news headlines. Indeed I do on occasion, she replied, and what I like about it is that when you're playing me, you very often say what I might be thinking but couldn't possibly say. So, there you are, we even had the Iron Lady's approval. At the same time, writers David Renwick and Andy Hamilton were giving me golden opportunities to put the boot in with Jim Callaghan. Roy. I always remember saying he did a party at uh, the conference one year and he quoted a musical song and he said uh, as the great Mari Lloyd used to sing there was I waiting at well it wasn't her of course uh, any of our listeners will know it was Lily Morris you know first saying that and I remember I was living in Reading at the time and I'm just getting on the train one day and he was on the train Oh, really? he, yeah, he was on the train, Callahan, and I said, Mr. Callahan, he said, what? You know, I said, you know you got that wrong, I said, about, it, was, it wasn't Barry Lord, it was Lily Morris. He said, don't you, Star, I have enough of you on that news headlines, he said. <laughs> <laughs> and what about Glennis Kinnock's reaction to June's version of her? June and I first met the Kinnocks at a water rat's ball. Roy introduced Neil, that's right, I said, you know, do you know... June and he, he, he said uh, yes of course I know June uh, you know she she does Glenys and I, I said uh, oh I do hope she doesn't take offence you see and he said uh, oh he said no if she took offence she wouldn't have married me <laughs> which I thought was rather nice and what was also rather nice was Neil Kinnock's reaction to Roy's send up of him unbeknownst to Roy we secretly invited Neil along to Roy's interview and being the great sport that he is he turned up this was the moment when, at my request, Roy had just launched into a Welsh flight of fancy and Neil Kinnock walked into the studio to confront him face to face. Oh, it's lovely, lovely to be here with you. It's just absolutely wonderful. That you. was great, man. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Neil, welcome. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> Got him indeed. We then sat and listened to one of Tony Hare's sketches, the one he wrote after Neil Kinnock set about a couple of vandals outside the Labour leader's home in Ealing. Here's an excerpt. You've seen Rambo 12, Death Wish 18, and The Exterminator 27. Now, Red Flag Productions proudly brings to your screens a new superhero, self-appointed vigilante, expert in martial arts and hedge trimming. It's Kinnock the Ginger Ninja. What are you doing? Get down off the mantelpiece at once. Oh. Hello, Mary Spark. This is my new Kung Fu instructor. Hello. <laughs> Me Toshiba Hitachi. Gesundheit. <laughs> Neil, in the kitchen, please. Just a moment, Glennis. I'm practicing to become a finely tuned fighting machine, afraid of nothing, guided by my inner karma and answerable to no one. Neil, get in that kitchen. Very well, Glennis. <laughs> It won't be a minute, Hitachi. Bless you. How long is this silly nonsense going to last? It's not silly nonsense, Glennis. I've been chosen. Who by the oval teenies? No. <laughs> you can scoff, aren't I? But I'm going to make Ealing a cleaner and safer place to live in. Hiya! No, 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 Hitachi. When you want to come in, open the door. There's a good chap, didn't you? Oh, sorry. Okay, glass up a Kinnock. Time for a final test on your own. Oh, lovely, lovely, lovely. Take this and good luck. Oh, it's no good. I'm a failure. Glennis, can you do it? Honestly, Neil, can't you open a simple packet of biscuits? 
No, it is no disgrace for glass of a kinnock. Oh. Only peak fleeing whole solution to great mystery of unraveling biscuit lapper. <laughs> <laughs> and Glennis, how many more times must I tell you not to buy ginger nuts? <laughs> you know how sensitive I am about these things. <laughs> Think yourself lucky I didn't get Garibaldi. Yeah. And Neil's verdict? Oh, <laughs> <yes>. Ginger ninja. <laughs> <laughs> the ginger ninja. <laughs> oh, lovely, wonderful. Lovely, lovely. There you go. <laughs> One of the joyous things about doing the news headlines every week is the amount of fun we all have recording it. Jonathan James Moore. I must admit, when I'm working in the office and I suddenly think, goodness, it's Thursday, I can get away and go and see headlines. And I go down there and it is a, a real joy just to see this fun and good humour and to see an audience packed into the Paris just roaring with laughter. And sometimes laughing at certain things that only the studio audience can appreciate. For example, June did a wonderful voice for Barbara Bush. Oh, who goes there, friend or foe? Advance and be recognised. All right, fella, stand easy. I don't think he recognized you, George. Stop <laughs> shooting, soldier. This is President Bush, and I'm... <laughs> the first lady. Now, who did she base the voice on? You yeah. remember Marjorie Maine and all those wonderful old American films? She was always oh, talking like that. You know, so I thought, well, nobody knows how Barbara Bush... Talks. But of course, for that particular character, June didn't just say the lines. She even had to do her own sound effects. Well, I seem to remember I had the script in one hand and there was a little gong hanging on a thing nearby and I had a little stick and I had to do my own uh, spittoon boing. <laughs> I did a <laughs> boing <laughs> and probably forgot where I was in the script after that, I should think. Many times to the delight of the studio audience. And talking of delights, Here's a charming character that's still with us, first created by writer Charlie Adams way back in 1979. Food additives became a major issue in the 80s, not to mention the things which farmers were spraying their crops with. Well, it's tricky when you're caught short on your tractor, isn't it? But... <laughs> one story headlines investigating concerned strawberries treated with dangerous chemicals which grew to the size of a man's fist. Next! Whoa! <laughs> Morning, Doctor. Ah, Mr. Friggins. Sorry? Yes, I don't see you very often. Now, um, what seems to be the problem? Well, Doctor, I had one of them giant strawberries last night, and mm -hmm. when I got up this morning, this had happened. <laughs> oh, God, man. Do your raincoat up quick. <laughs> what did you say caused it? Strawberries. Let me have another look. <laughs> You're absolutely sure it was the strawberry? Definitely strawberries. Right. I'll give you some cream to put on it. <laughs> yeah, I tell you, listeners, it is quite something, that particular sketch. As soon as they start, as soon as we start next, <laughs> they start laughing, you know. And in comes Chris's Friggins, who actually does flash <laughs> in the studio. <laughs> But it's usually just with his jumper, folks, and he has a pair of trousers underneath. So don't start clamouring for tickets immediately. Mind you, you might do if you knew this sort of thing went on. Dirk Mags. I remember Ole Stepaniuk wrote a sketch called Hardy Amy's. Which wasn't a sketch exactly, it was just a two-line quickie. But... Came the time to actually perform the sketch in front of the audience. We weren't to realise what Roy and Chris were going to do with it. And neither did we. Roy first acknowledged me by name, I snapped into character and quite spontaneously leaned across the microphone and fingered the lapel of his jacket. This was the result. Sir Hardy Amos. Yes. yes. <laughs> Don't do that, please. Uh, <laughs> Sir Hardy. Yes. For the past 40 years, you have been the royal dressmaker. That's quite right, yes. <laughs> Lovely material. <laughs> Not one of mine, is no, it? Yeah. <laughs> Not likely to be either, no. It's... 
So really, let me put it this way. Oh. <laughs> it is one of mine. Lay your cards right, it could be. Wait, 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 I'm sorry. So really, Sir Hardy. Uh, well, you can call me hard, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll call you hard, all right, yeah. Really? <laughs> Longer than you... Murdoch and Maxwell. <laughs> That's only two lines. <laughs> really, you have been responsible for the way the Queen looks. That's correct, yes. yes. Now, how have you done this exactly? Well, just before Her Royal Highness leaves for an official engagement... Yes? ...I make her suck a lemon. Mm. <laughs> And to make matters worse, I had mistakenly called the Queen Her Royal Highness instead of Her Majesty, and this led to a retake, which was even more riotous than the original. Some of the other outtakes I wouldn't dare broadcast. They shall remain a secret between myself, the BBC lawyers, and the studio audience playmates. After all, we've been going for 19 years now, and we would like to carry on. Over that period, Roy has been the proud recipient of six prestigious awards. In 1977, the Variety Club's Radio Personality of the Year. In 1985, the Television and Radio Industries Club Award. Our live election night special in 1987 won the Premius Ondas Award. That's the radio equivalent of television's Golden Rose of Montreux. 1988, the Daily Mail Comedy Award. 1990 brought a top accolade, the Sony Gold Award for services to radio comedy, and bang up to date, in February 1994, Roy was again voted BBC Radio Personality of the Year by the Variety Club. It's, I mean, it's an amazing quiver full of uh, trophies, but all highly well-deserved. I mean, it is, without doubt, our flagship programme, and it's actually rather sweet now that it's steaming ahead of HMS Troutbridge. Um, and so the, the, the HUD tub uh, is now rowing uh, at the head of the flotilla. I mean, the writers are 90% of the news headlines, I would say. Absolutely 90%. And by golly, we've been so lucky over the years. Every single one of those awards should go to the whole team, really. I mean, I know I sound like Richard Attenborough. I'm going to start crying in a minute. <laughs> but it really should go to the whole team. It should go to that. I mean, really, how do you split it? Sort of about 300 right ways, because they're the, we've had about 300 writers, I should think, over the years who've contributed things. should go to them. Uh, to you and June, we should all share those, those awards. You were just pleased to be able to contribute to it. I mean, I think it's very much, you know, it's, OK, maybe down to, it's down to the writing to some degree. I always assumed that when I joined it, it was already flourishing and yeah. very healthy. I've always assumed it would go on forever. And, um, you know, I, don't, I wouldn't mind if it, it's it, the last thing I, you know, one of the last things I hear before I peg out. I've always assumed that it will. Um, and I think it's now achieved that kind of, cultural preeminence it should be allowed to go on and on and i'll bring a curse down on the head of anyone who tries to interfere with it i think and perhaps a final tribute from simon brett and john lloyd who started it all off well good old roy is what i think absolutely good old roy mm. it'll go on forever even we owe after... it all to you roy thanks very much even me. after roy's dead he won't let a little thing like that stop him <laughs> <laughs> well there we are folks what has had to be a lightning trip through 19 years of the news headlines all that remains is for me to thank Tony Hare for his invaluable help in putting all this lot together and my producer, Phil Bowker. As the old showbiz adage goes, always end on a song. And here's the one I promised earlier. It's a Hudlines classic from the molting quill of Peter Spence way back in 1976. Talking of antiques, I see Frank Sinatra's been in the news this week. <laughs> a university has awarded him a Doctorate of Humanities. But I mean, if Frank Sinatra can get a doctorate just by singing, it must have been a pretty peculiar interview. And... Now, Mr. Sinatra, before you go in for your final exam, you have to have a medical. Now... Yes, now. What do you think of the idea? The end. So, you'll be glad to know the doctor, um... Is near. Yeah, you got it. He isn't here yet. And so I face the final. Not yet, because I'm going to do the checkup. So take all your clothes off and go behind the uh... curtain. Yeah, that's it. You got it. You got it. <laughs> My friend. Yeah, I'm afraid you'll have to undress that as well. All you have to do. <laughs> all 
All you have to do is say R a few times. I'll say it clear. That's the spirit, that's the spirit. And then you just fill in the forms. I'll state my case. Yes, every case of any disease of what you've ever suffered. Of which? Sorry, of which you've ever suffered. <laughs> Are you sure that sounds right? I'm certain. Okay, you do look a bit old to be at a university. I've lived a life. How are you getting on with that sample bottle? That's full. Already? Splendid. Good, good. Now, Mr. Sinatra, to your expenses for coming, do you go first or second class? I've traveled each. Fine, fine. You came on the main road from the station? And every byway. Oh, oh. Well, in that case, we can only cover some of your expenses. Say, $20. But more. Well, $30, then. Much more than this. Good heavens, you must have come a long way round. I did it my way. Stop! 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 Wait, wait, wait! You're overflowing the bottle! Regrets. <laughs> oh, no, no, don't apologize. I've had a few. <laughs> yeah, I can see you have. <laughs> but then again... Uh, no, no, that'll be quite enough. <laughs> Too few to mention. It's all right, you can stop now. I did what I had to do. <laughs> Yeah, so you did, but what are we gonna do now? Saw it through. Saw <laughs> it through? Good heavens, that's a bit drastic, is it? N nurse, 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 nurse. Bring a bucket and a mop quick before the doctor gets back. Have I passed? I should say you have. <laughs> Next time, I'd be glad if you did it my way. No! You can have fun editing this bloody lot, Chris.